So, this gives you an example of uh, uh, a polygenic trait. So, the nature of polygenic trait is they are not binary, it is not like tall and short or uh, you know terminal flower or axial flower uh, purple or white. So, they have uh, variation okay, there are shades like if you take for example, um, the height of human beings okay, it is not like uh, there are set of people who are dwarf and there are set of people who are tall. So, you have an entire range. If you measure the height of a certain number of um, you know individuals like for example, this class is little bit small, but still good enough. If you measure uh, the height of all of us and plot it, the graph will look like the one seen in this uh, slide. Okay. So, extremely short or extremely tall individuals will be fewer in the population and majority will be somewhere in between the two. So, there will be an average where the number will be maximum. So, it gives you a bell shaped curve and that is because of multiple genes each having uh, different alleles and what combination come together could determine the outcome phenotypic outcome. So, here we are talking about skin color in some organism I forgot which one this is. Um, the skin color here is determined by three different genes. Okay. So, let us say you have a parent with uh, which is uh, totally heterozygous for all the genes and then you cross with another one like pretty much selfing then you will get these many combinations genotypes you know 164th will be completely recessive and so on. Um, and the other extreme again is 164 completely dominant and then in between these many combinations. So, what is the contribution of a, a given allele of a gene in combination with another allele of another gene and so on. So, you get variations in the color. So, and uh, that kind of tells variation in the phenotype uh, is usually a good indicator of polygenic inheritance. A human height is a good example and in this particular organism the color shade is um, a good example. Is this clear polygenic inheritance ok. So, now this seal can quickly breeze through. So, environments do influence the you know the gene may be a single gene produces a certain pigment and the pigment uh, color could be sensitive to the pH. So, the plant grown in alkaline soil versus acidic soil can have different colors. This does not mean in this plant flower color inheritance uh, failed to follow Mendelian inheritance. And there are opposite situations. You will get multiple phenotypes due to one single gene mutation. It depends on which gene is affected. A good example is uh, sickle cell anemia. Here you have one amino acid mutation you know a glutamic acid to valine mutation due to one base change, but then that affects the three dimensional structure of the globin <coughs> polypeptide such that the hemoglobin molecules can uh, aggregate and form long rod like shapes aggregations and that affects the shape of the RBC and the RBC becomes sickle shaped and that is why this is called a sickle cell anemia. Okay. So, there so, the genotype is clearly one single variation. So, two different alleles one has glutamic acid another has valine two different alleles one single gene only, but the biochemical nature of that protein causes multiple phenotypes uh, due to that um, RBC being like that and those RBC are going to be broken down and because they are not available and uh, oxygen is not transported then you have problems like physical weakness, anemia and uh, since they cl uh, clog the artery then you have problem on heart, then blood vessels uh, get blocked and due to that you have problem in brains and uh, these cells accumulate in organs where these are degraded and due to that are damage to other organs and as a result the final outcome here just at least 5 of them are listed these are 5 different phenotypes coming from single mutation. So, here again you have Mendelian inheritance being followed at the genotype level, but not at the phenotype level 
and you understand the phenotype and you understand the biochemistry and physiology of uh, how that particular gene product functions. Okay, so, all of this to learn all of this and to learn lot more which we will learn in this class and in next few classes, you do not need to know the molecules. Okay, you do not need to know chromosome or DNA sequence. So, you can simply generate mutations and set up genetic crosses, follow the inheritance pattern uh, faithfully adhering to Mendel's laws, then you will learn lot about what those genes do. Okay, without knowing even the protein sequence. Um, like we have found a gene involved in God and peak color, right? but we, we did not find out what protein is, but we clearly know there is a gene that is determining the flower color. So, in that same way you can do complex genetic experiments and learn lot about gene function without really knowing protein product. So, then uh, we are kind of uh, you know going back to history and trying to recollect uh, the historical sequence of events very quickly. So, people wondered fine I, the based on the phenotype we understand uh, what Mendel is talking about this gene etcetera, but what is the physical basis of it, where, what, are, what is the nature of gene, where are they present you know. Um, so, then um, people who were observing cells using microscope you know called cytologists, chromosomes segregate very much like the way Mendel's genes. Okay. So, for example, chromosomes and genes both are present in pairs, you know you have like for example, in our cells you have 23 pairs meaning there are chromosomes like for example, if you take chromosome 1 there is one more chromosome among the 46 that look like chromosome 1 like that you can actually sort the 46 into 23 pairs. Okay. So, therefore, they exist in pairs like Mendel's you know capital P capital P or small p small p and homologous chromosomes separate and alleles segregate during meiosis. Okay. So, you get only one of the two chromosomes I am going to say allelic chromosomes only one of the allelic chromosomes comes to the gamete and Mendel's assumption also one of the two capital P's only will be there in a gamete and fertilization restores the two capital P's together or a capital P with a small p and similarly the homologous chromosomes come together again. So, all of this told that probably genes are on chromosomes. Okay. So, you celebrate the solving of double helix right but these were the bedrocks to the that discovery eventually. So, this illustrates in a cartoon fashion what I just told you. So, you assume uh, you know for the flower color it is on one chromosome and um, you know shape on the other chromosome and then you find only one each in the gamete and we are assuming here okay they are in two different chromosomes and we therefore we are only taking two chromosomes here and fertilization they come together and then you have different combinations so this we will see in some detail in the next slide and then you have this uh, homologous chromosome separation and then the sister chromatids separate and then they come together to make the next generation so if you assumed a uh, color is on one chromosome and uh, shape is in the another chromosome and follow through this meiotic process and then you get this uh, gametes and then you if you bring it to the f2 then you will find they follow the same ratio as Mendel's experiments. Okay. And uh, so, there is another evidence that uh, conclusively proved that genes are on chromosomes that uh, came from Morgan's uh, work. Um, so, I, I think I mentioned this earlier right uh, while talking about preformation and um, epigenesis right. So, so the you know Morgan identified na unlike the pea plants where there were lot of characteristics or phenotypes in which variations were naturally available uh, in Morgan's experimental model Drosophila there were not variations. So, he did not find any and after a lot of search he ended up finding what just one male that had white eye. Okay. 
and successfully setting up a mating with that one male ok, uh, he discovered eventually that genes are on chromosomes ok, we will see that just for the fun of it ok, even if you may already be familiar with this. So, now let us assume ok, the gene for eye color is on the X chromosome. Now, we will call this W plus ok, that is how the Drosophila genetics do you know they put a plus for the wild type or the one where the function is like dominant allele and minus for the one that is a mutant or where the gene function is not there. In this particular example the plus is absent here in this cartoon ok. So, now the female will have two copies, male will have only one copy. So, Morgan uh, reasoned that that one copy was mutant in that male and the male did not produce the red pigment and therefore, it is white. Now, when the gamete forms the male is going to make Y in one sperm or like you know half of the sperm and then the X chromosome in the other one and the female will have only one and when they are brought together in fertilization see you the females will get one copy for sure from the female. So, you have one wild type copy as a result the female will be red ok, the eyes will be red and the male here uh, will have uh, one copy coming from the female because uh, you know you have uh, one sperm right. So, here when the Y comes then you are going to have this uh, uh, normal allele or the wild type allele coming from the female. So, therefore, in F 1 it will be male also will be red color. Now, let us look at the segregation when you go to the next generation. So, this female who got that mutant X chromosome from the male ok, because male could not have had it. So, may to be male it should uh, inherit the Y chromosome from the male and therefore, this male inherited a good uh, X chromosome from the female and that is why in F 1 it is red color. Now, this mutant X chromosome that came from the male is in this F 1 female and she produces two kinds of uh, gametes, one will have the mutant X chromosome, the other one will have the wild type. Now, to make a male you need the Y chromosome and therefore, you will have two kinds of males, one getting the wild type allele from the female, another one getting the mutant allele and now you will end up finding in the males you have 1 is to 1 ratio of white color and red color and you never see red color in the female. So, this sex linked inheritance immediately told the gene for the eye color is not just on a chromosome it is actually on X chromosome ok. So, this conclusively proved whatever the cytologists were observing and comparing with the Mendelian inheritance of genes uh, you know is clearly true and that genes are on chromosomes. This is something you should know even if uh, this looks elementary education, but uh, it is worthwhile knowing how we found genes are on chromosomes ok. You are not going to tell I am going to do NGS or I am going to do northern hybridization etcetera. So, this is how it was found. <laughs> Is this clear? Ok. So, I uh, will tell you a little bit of history here we, before we go into the next uh, uh, new idea. The new idea is not that genes are always on two different chromosomes and one chromosome has multiple genes. If they have then what kind of inheritance will be followed. So, that is what is in this slide. So, before going into this uh, you would be wondering if Mar Morgan struggled hard to find one white male then now how you have you know black body, grey body and uh, normal wild type being vestigial wing how did you get all of this. So, Morgan and his students had no idea at that time um, how to mutate genes ok. Uh, Mendel used what is available in nature. So, Morgan searched hard and found one that was found in nature. So, now how do you create variations? 
So, they decided to mutate and they did not know what is the nature of gene. So, as a result they did not know how to mute uh, change that material. If you know the material you will know how to handle it. So, they kind of tortured the flies you know put them in low pressure, high pressure, heat, cold, uh, pluck one leg and or one feather wing and see what happens. They did all kinds of things, nothing happened and one of his students Muller learnt uh, that some physicists called Ronjan had just discovered a thing called the x-rays and they have wavelengths in terms of the distances among atoms in molecules and gene is probably of that dimension you know if it is chromosome then we are talking about subcellular objects. So, I needed to perturb at that level and these x-rays are probably going to perturb at that level because of its wavelength being at interatomic distances in a molecule. So, they shined x-rays and then they got all kinds of mutant flies ok. So, x-rays were the first mutagen used. So, therefore, now we can start with this experiment ok. So, now you know why we have these. So, Morgan did an experiment by crossing between uh, one uh, fly strain that had wild type wings, but grey abdomen uh, black and uh, so vestigial is what we are going to say here. So, black is this body color and uh, when you have the wild type gene then you call it as B plus. And when you have the normal wing you call it as vestigial uh, because in flies as well as in some other organisms the phenotype is what is eventually given rise to the name. So, body color black. So, wing being small vestigial wing they call it as vestigial that mutant was called vestigial. So, the wild type gene that makes the normal wing is called V G plus ok. So, so, he took one where obviously, this is now pure breeding for these two phenotypes. Then they took another one where you have the black body and vestigial wing. Then did a cross, um, so they got the F 1 hybrid where the dominant is showing here, here the dominant is the wild type copy. So, you have one good copy that is enough to make normal wing and uh, grey abdomen ok. So, now you have this heterozygous and we already learnt to test cross and if you do test cross you should get 1 is to 1 ratio right that is what we have learnt earlier. Um, so, instead Morgan got this ratio at the bottom it was not 1 is to 1 ratio uh, which would have indicated that each one is following the 3 is to 1 ratio monohybrid wise and uh, at the same time. Uh, so, that would have indicated an independent assortment, but if it was not independently assorting then you should have gotten in this test cross exactly 1 is to 1 ratio which is equivalent to normal F 1 where F 1 to F 2 3 is to 1 ratio ok. So, there you would have selfed, but here you are back crossing and as a result instead of 3 is to 1 ratio you will get 1 is to 1 ratio. So, he did not get that. So, this made him to think they are probably on the same chromosome, if they are on the same chromosome we will think that they should follow the rules of monohybrid cross right. Like if uh, they are together in one chromosome and do not think crossover ok, we have not learnt crossover here. So, so we do not know what crossover is, we did not learn meiosis. So, we only know this yeah this ok, shape is in one chromosome, colour is in another chromosome. Now, if they are in two different thing you will follow 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratio in a normal cross from F 1 to F 2 uh, without test cross. And if they are on the same chromosome you will follow 3 is to 1 ratio right like the for this capital Y and small y coming together here uh, in the various combinations it is 1 is to 2 is to 1 ratio and phenotype is 3 is to 1 ratio. So, he did not get either. So, he reasoned that they are probably on the same chromosome, but they have a way of sometimes separating probably the chromosomes break and join ok. So, that is the idea uh, that Morgan thought of to explain uh, this 
okay, evidence for linked genes. So, why did Mendel see something like this when he has used so many different phenotypes that is simply because fortuitously for him the chromosome size is extremely small. Okay, so, he got lucky. So, every phenotype he chose were on different chromosomes because the chromosome size is small. So, maybe if he had looked at 500 different uh, phenotypes he, he would have run into this problem or uh, you know then you are likely to find two genes on the same chromosome. So, here Ma Morgan saw this and then he proposed genes are probably on the, the like multiple genes can be on the same chromosome, but they do not stay there put forever there seems the chromosome seem to exchange uh, swap parts okay. a part of uh, chromosome 1 m exchanges equivalent part with chromosome 1 p okay, pet maternal and paternal. So, that is what I am saying m and p. So, that is what he proposed all right and that is explained here. So, normally uh, so, so, these were the parents and most offsprings will be like this because they are not separating and they are together um, or they will be like this. So, this is what normally you would expect, but imagine this happening crossover like the once the chromosome duplicated this is let us say chromosome 1 m and this is chromosome 1 p after the interface they are duplicated. Now, the duplicated ones if they are going to swap parts as you see here, then you can end up producing these two right. See we started with B plus and V G plus. Now, you have a situation where you have B plus and V G just V G no plus and that is because of this swap. So, this was something the cytologist had observed during meiosis. And uh, Mendel proposed something like that can happen, and you will have these recombinants. Okay, so this sort of a thing you call as recombinant. Like when you are going to get ultimately a phenotype where you have the black-bodied fly having normal wing, which is not like this or this. Okay, the parental phenotype is normal wing and grey abdomen but suppose you get normal wing and black abdomen or um, you know black abdomen and normal wing sorry that is what I said and the other one is uh, you have the black body with the normal wing. So, if these things happen then he called them as recombinant progeny. So, you need to know this how to identify recombinants the two phenotypes get mixed in the progeny and because that is essential to think about the next topic in this. So, by proposing that model he could explain how you got this ratio. So, in most of them the swapping did not happen between the p plus uh, p and v g loci and as a result most of them ended up being like this parental resembled either one of the two parents and in some of them where that crossover or recombination happened you ended up having recombinant offspring ok. So, in this particular example you can determine the recombination frequency by calculating among the progeny test cross progeny you total the progeny you got which is 2300 and then you look at how many that are recombinants that is you know you have a black body with a normal wing or grey body with vestigial wing when you have that they do not look like the parent and you total them and in this particular example that is 391. So, this 391 divided by 300 2300 uh, times uh, you know convert to percentage by multiplying 100 then you get 17 percent. So, the recombination frequency in this case is 17 percent ok. So, Muller and uh, few other of uh, Morgan's descendants did not stop there. They proposed if the genes are closer together then the recombination frequency is likely to be less. The probability of assuming that the crossover the, the parts can be swapped anywhere along the length of the chromosome 
Now, if you take two loci that are farther apart, then the probability a cross happens between the two is higher than when you have chosen them closer together. So, that means the recombination frequency is a function of the distance between the two loci. In other words, can I take two different uh, phenotypes and cross them and based on recombination frequency determine the distance between the two loci on the gene. So, this is the basis for genetic mapping. Okay. So, the recombination frequency indicates the distance between the two genes on the chromosome. So, this way of determining the distance between the two genes is not exactly physical distance. So, physical distance we measure by the number of DNA base pairs. This is based on frequency, the frequency is not always directly proportional to the physical length because due to the chemical nature like for example, the structural um, uniqueness for different sequences you could have some uh, parts of the chromosome where recombination readily happens more readily happens in other loci you will have variations, but more or less they follow okay? uh, except those mutational what we call hot spots where the frequency of recombination is higher than an average locus um, except those exceptions mostly this holds good and this is the basis by which genetic maps are developed. So, so, this kind of tells you uh, if you take another um, locus here uh, this C n and then uh, when you do the same experiment as shown in between the black and vestigial uh, you know it was determined that in the previous one we saw between B and V G it is 17 percent and then by finding out the distance between these two and these two people are able to tell uh, V G is actually on this side on the left side of black on the chromosome and it is at this distance. So, that we will learn um, in detail when we go to a genetic cross later. Okay. But, um, the, the main point here is the recombination frequency reflects the distance between different loci on a given chromosome. Okay, so, one other thing that you probably overlooked um, if you were a student like me in the school, uh, but otherwise you may be knowing. So, the variations are not generated, we, we are already seeing that the variation does not mean uh, st strictly arising out of new mutations. Okay it can arise due to simply allelic shuffling during crossover right like for example you look at this right this uh, individual here and this individual there was no new mutation that happened in either one of them no base was changed during dna replication it is just that allele of which allele of one gene and which allele of another gene came together because of the crossover generated this variation. This is important because most variations in nature on which the nature selection works is based on that. So, the variations among us here is not purely due to each one of us generated a new mutation as we began as a zygote. It is simply by uh, which one of your two grandparents during recombination during gametogenesis in your parents were swapped and brought together we call that as allelic shuffling. Okay. So, remember this in future I might use that word just uh, commonly without explaining allelic shuffling creates variation. You do not even need that to create variation particularly if you consider an organism which has 23 pairs of chromosome all you need to do is look at this. Okay. So, now let us look at this. So, so we are going to have uh, we are going to look at two chromosomes here. Okay. So, this is chromosome 1 which is duplicated therefore, two sister chromatids are together here and this is let us say this came from your uh, you know mother the blue color and this uh, red came from your father both are duplicated and now in metaphase they could be like this purely randomly for both the chromosomes the maternal copy was as it is here on the right side and the paternal copy was on the left side or it could be this way. 
for one of them it was on the left side and for the one other one it was on the right side purely by random there are no selections here the force that operates here is bringing all chromosomes to the metaphase plate and making sure uh, one of the two homologous chromosomes go to one uh, daughter cell after meiosis 1 while the other one goes to the other daughter cell uh, of the meiosis 1. So, that is all it does, it does not worry about which one of the two allelic chromosomes were taken. So, as shown in this cartoon you could get this situation. If this happens after meiosis 2 where the sister chromatids are separated, you will end up having uh, you know uh, combination 1 where you have uh, for both the chromosomes you got the paternal, maternal and uh, combination 2 for both chromosomes you got the maternal or you could have these. So, you could already have 4 different variations generated in the gamete even without mutations and allelic shuffling coming from crossover. Is this clear? So, you need to remember because these are all really fundamentals to follow what actually happens in biology. I do, I do not weigh what happens in genetics because this cow governs everything else. So, for rest of genetics what I am going to do is I am going to take one model organism and use a genetic screen done in that organism as an example to understand some of the fundamental concepts. Okay. It could be done using any one of the genetic models. So, I am taking a model where I am familiar with the original literature. So, for obvious reasons it is going to be C elegans. So, this topic can be taught and understood using Drosophila or Arabidopsis as an example, uh, but in this particular screen you are going to find all different concepts are there in just in that one screen itself. Okay. So, before we go into that a brief introduction of model organisms. Okay. So, I am going to ask a question. Okay, I will give you one fact and ask a question. Usually when I want to select an organism as a model organism, its genome size smaller the better. Why? Okay, so, if I want to look for a gene involved in germ cell development in C. elegans having only 100 uh, million bases versus finding a gene involved in the same gene involved in germ cell development in 3 billion bases. Right? I need to screen a minimum of 30 times more individuals after mutagenesis in that the second organism which is the homo sapiens. Okay. So, you need to know this many times people just to say that smaller genome, but they do not understand why smaller genome. And the second one which is illustrated here you know the times. So, here is an adult okay. this is about 1 millimeter long it is not this big as shown in this image. Um, this adult produces embryo which will go through the larval stages at these hours mentioned here becomes an adult reproducing again in less than 3 days okay, a little more than 2 and a half days, but certainly by third day. So, large loss uh, sorry short life cycle how does that help? You get multiple generations. Yes. So, if you go from F1 to F2 and want to find out inheritance pattern and you are looking for recombination frequency all that uh, in, in a PhD period uh, you know 5 times 365 divided by 3 that many generations you will get, but instead if it is homo sapiens you are not even going to have uh, the in the F1 reaching reproductive maturity in your PhD time. Okay. So, forget about ethical questions it is a it is a difficult <laughs> organism to work with. So, those are some of the advantages with C elegans there are more, but I am not going to get into all those details we will learn them as we go. Um, okay. So, this is a necessary information that we need to before we go forward that is uh, sex determination in C elegans happens if you have like in any other organism if you have two any other sexually reproducing organism that we are familiar 2 x means it is a female it is written hermaphrodites I will explain in a minute uh, and if you have x 0 there is no y chromosome. So, it is actually number of x determines here 
Okay, people usually say x to autosome ratio. So uh, I will I will simplify that as number of x chromosome, two x chromosome female, one x chromosome male. And this x zero arises usually due to defects in meiosis called non disjunction where both the uh, homologous chromosomes go into one of the daughters after meiosis one therefore the other daughter lacks that chromosome entirely and the after meiosis two the gamete you get will not have the x chromosome if non disjunction happened with the x chromosome and so that is how and if that gamete fuses with a normal gamete having one x chromosome you get the x zero situation and those um, zygotes will eventually end up becoming males okay and interestingly these females during their sexual maturation okay let us say to give a human equivalent during adolescence when the first germ cell starts to mature um, what is going to happen is they are going to enter through spermatogenesis they are going to may follow the male pathway of differentiation and they become um, you know the they give rise to sperm and those sperm produced are stored in a pouch and then it switches into after the first 40 germ cells that go through this roughly 40 it is not fixed 40 then they switch to oogenesis and it behaves like a female. So, I said female because her anatomy is a female anatomy she has the uterus and she has the vulva to lay the embryos out. So, bodily she is a female it is just that she can make sperm as well, but she does that only when she is young ok is this clear and that is how because she makes both the gametes we call her a hermaphrodite anatomy anatomically she is a female clear and it is a sexual reproduction you have meiosis 1 homologous chromosomes duplicate and separate during meiosis 1 and before that they do have crossover happening and two gametes will have to fuse to make a new zygote. So, it is a perfect sexual reproduction except that you just imagine you are able to make both gametes ok and uh, so that is the hermaphrodite and the males are males normal males like x y males so anatomically they are differentiated as a male they have vast difference make lot of sperm and they have the copulatory organ to mate with the hermaphrodite and they do not have uterus or vulva ok. So, they cannot uh, uh, you know get an egg and fertilize and make a uh, embryo inside their body. So, males are like any other sexually reproducing male. So, this gives us a big advantage for genetics. So, that is one of the reasons why I need to introduce it at this point. So, now when the males if you look at the male testis and you look at the sperm since males started with x 0 now through normal uh, meiosis with no defects half of the sperm will have x and half of the sperm will have no x because there is only one x and therefore, when a male mates with a hermaphrodite 50 percent of the sperm will have x 50 percent will have no x. So, as a result without looking for any meiotic defect the progeny will be 50 percent male 50 percent hermaphrodite ok. So, so why is this advantage is for genetics you can do selfing without going through the labor that uh, Mendel went through all you need to do is take the hermaphrodite put in one plate she makes both the gametes there is no need to cut open the flower and put a cover and take a paint brush take pollen none of that is required. So, when you want to cross you take the male of the right genotype and here hermaphrodite of the right genotype put them together and they will produce you know a hybrid kids in next class we will continue from there and we will look at actual experiments and what can be learned from them. So, the main point I am driving home is you can learn lot about molecules and their functions without ever actually knowing the DNA sequence or purifying the protein and determining what that protein does ok. So, that is what we are going to learn at the end of this series of genetics classes.